We're now on to our second. So we've got a fantastic panel conversation, uh, which is going to be chaired by the fantastic and brilliant Nick North, uh, Director of Audiences at the BBC. So I'm going to invite Nick and his amazing team that he's pulled together to come share their views. Thank you. Why don't we move along and in no particular order? Ah, oh, thank you. Now, I've got, the, uh, I've got the magic thing with the Slido, so any questions, ping them in, and I shall be looking at this. Um, right. We're here to talk about generative AI, and uh, we've already heard it mentioned a couple of times already this morning. Uh, Pippa talked about um, people's concerns around disinformation in an election year. Um, and the importance of trust in the media, in our social institutions. So never a more important time perhaps to talk about a technology that strikes fear into the hearts of some. Um, people think about the Terminator for some reason, which is the real, the real terrifying thing about the Terminator is the time travel, not the artificial intelligence. Uh, <clears throat> but um, So we've got about 40 minutes, I think, to try to get to grips with this topic, to, to think about how this is going to change our worlds as, as citizens, as consumers, as employees as well, um, and explore how generative AI is being used or could be used in, in the world of insight and analytics that we all inhabit today. Um, and we'll explore this through the lens of research agencies, tech companies, consultancies, and how client-side researchers are starting to take advantage of this um, new capability. So I'm delighted to have with me some leading thinkers and practitioners uh, here to help us explore this. Um, but first, I think, let's start with another show of hands. So a straw poll. How many people think that generative AI will affect you in your professional life? Hands up. <laughs> Great. Keep your hands up. Keep your hands up if you're completely clear on how it will affect you. Okay. For everyone else in the room, myself included, this session is for you to help you figure out how you can ride this wave and, and, and find the future. And if we're not successful as a group, the people who had their hands up just at the end, just talk to them instead. Okay, so, and, and listen, if you're not sure, you're not alone. A recent Qual Qualtrics survey showed that 90% of market researchers believe that AI will have a significant impact on the industry. But only 30% of us claim to know what that impact will look like. So we're here to explore that. Um, and, but it's clear it's going, to, it's going to affect every part of the supply chain, and that's what's so challenging at the same time. So it's going to change how we think about product development right through to kind of pricing strategies at the other end. And, and we're already seeing the changes. We're seeing traditional market research companies starting to kind of offer Gen AI-powered services. We're starting to see its power in knowledge management with the likes of Stravito and Market Logic, starting to unlock all that insight in the, in the, in the archives of, of a business. Um, research practitioners, uh, there are many here today, 2CV I was talking to the other day, just really sort of challenging the structure between qualitative and quantitative research. Um, others like Colu, unlocking uh, how much we can get from qualitative analysis, and, and others, and I think MX8 is one of, our, one of, one of the companies um, here today, sort of challenging the whole end-to-end -end research process. So a lot going on and a lot to explore. And, and Jane gave it a plug earlier on. If you haven't read the MRS Delphi Group's work on this, Colin Strong's at the back there, um, definitely worth a read. And Jake Stedman and the uh, MRS Advanced Insight and Analytics Group also exploring this space. And if you want to get involved, get in touch with Jake. Um, OK, so. Um, we talked a bit about hype, Jane, and is it hype? Is it? I don't know. I find myself sort of at every different point in that hype cycle. I'm kind of excited by it, slightly disillusioned with what I saw last week, but this week that looks amazing. And, and also I've got used to using ChatGPT and just to kind of answer all questions about, you know, what should I cook for dinner and so on. So it's, it's, it, but it's the speed of change that is so extraordinary. Um, so how do we get to grips with this? My panel is going to help us. Um, so I'm delighted to have here Kelly Beaver, MBE, uh, CEO of Ipsos UK and Ireland, 
uh, Jatin Ethora, the Director of Research and Development at the BBC, Josh Monk, um, the Director of Retail, Consumer and Services at Faculty, and Chris Lindsley, Global Insight and Analytics Director in the Insights Centre of Excellence at Reckitt. So, we've got now probably about 35 minutes. Um, I, I want to give you all as much time as possible, so we're going to try to keep it short on the stage and open it up for questions as soon as we can. But first, let's sort of start with the big picture. Jatin, can I turn to you first? How is Gen AI changing our lives? And what are some of the ways that BBC R&D is exploring that? And think about how do we use these new capabilities both, both to kind of help us through this world of disinformation and also unlock the opportunities for us. Fantastic. I'll, I'll build upon the point that you just started, which is, is it hype? Is it noisy? I think the truth is, yes, it is. 80% of what we hear is still noise. 20% is quite real. And the reason I say this is that because artificial intelligence actually has been around for a very long time. It's just that we're only realizing because the pace of change and access to AI is, is easy. I remember um, back in 2017, when we started with this journey on thinking about what we could be doing within BBC, it was really, really hard. And I'll give you an example. Do you think there's AI being used right now? Close caption. There's AI there. Back in 2017, accuracy for that kind of capability was less than 45%. Now, it's more than 92%. It would be a good test to see if my accent can be recognized, because that <laughs> says a lot about the data that is used for these AI um, capabilities. The point here is that you know, between 2017 and 2022, a lot has changed. Access to computational power, access to information, an ability to turn information into meaningful things. It's just changed the landscape. And since 2022, obviously generative AI, as we know now, has become utility. We all use it on a daily basis. If you're using a smartphone, you're already using it. If you're taking photographs, it's already being used. So it's there with us. The question is, how is that going to change the different industries that we work in? And I'll come to that in a minute. But I think the important thing from my point of view is the focus needs to be around the unique value that generative AI can deliver to many organizations and many industries. It's an opportunity to rethink the way businesses run. The way I think about this is generative AI now is infrastructure. It's like you taking photographs and you can store it without you thinking about it. Generative AI is that tool now that you have access to. The question is, are you gonna just share your photographs or are you gonna do something with it? And I think that's where the real question lies. Within BBC, um, again, taking the um, course, um, the, um, the subtitling as an example, back in 2017, we were the only organization who had 85% accuracy on speech to text because we have a huge amount of data that we were able to use to train um, speech-to-text capabilities. Now it's 92%, we can't compete. So we don't want to carry on doing that. However, it has helped us understand how AI can be utilized. At the same time, I think earlier today it was mentioned, disinformation and trust is super, super important. Disinformation, once we publish a piece of content on the internet, we have no control over it. How do you know if you see something from BBC on a social media platform, it genuinely comes from BBC. It's really difficult. A um, few weeks ago, we have had a breakthrough, obviously five years worth of work that we put in, verifiable content. Because of generative AI, we are thinking about whether the content that we consume on social media platform is verified or not. We were leading on that five years ago. No one wanted to do anything about it, particularly the social media platforms did not want to do anything with it. But we carried on developing technical standards. We call it Project Origin, and there's a technical standard called C2PA, which basically allows any organization that deals with media to certify whether a piece of media comes from the organization it says it comes from. Not only that, we're able to provide more information, journalistic, rigor that we go through behind the scenes. We're able to share more information about a piece of media 
that would have been quite difficult for us to communicate to our, communicate to our audiences. So a lot is changing, and I think there's real opportunity, but at the same time, there are lots of challenges to deal with it as well. Mm -hmm. Great, thank you. Um, Kelly, mm. you oversee Ipsos's work across the whole of the UK. Um, so as a business leader, where do you see the opportunities emerging um, for you to invest in generative AI, develop generative AI, deliver value to your clients yeah. using it? Great question. So I really liked how you described it as infrastructure because that's exactly how we see it as Ipsos as well. We believe in the power of human intelligence, partnering with artificial intelligence, and the artificial intelligence capability has really scaled and escalated, as we know, over the last 12 to 18 months. So just to give you a bit of backdrop of what we've done before I explain a bit more, around October, November 2022, we recognised that we needed to make substantive investments in our own artificial intelligence infrastructure. And so by June time in 2023, we had launched a programme called Ipsos Facto, which is our own secure AI, generative AI capability at Ipsos, which we've been building and teaching and training for each of the various teams. We also knew there were areas in our business where we could go really deep and see the benefits quickly. Things like Synthesio, which is our social media analytics platform, online communities, some of those bits of the business, you could go deep and you could see productivity gains quite fast. But we needed a general layer of uplift and awareness, understanding and AI enablement across the workforce. We have about 2,000 people. I cover Ireland as well, Nick, you missed that. Uh, the UK My and Ireland. Is. And as a result, you need mass training and development in a really hands-on way. And so we started rolling out our all-staff training programs from September 2023. So that, and then of course, some pure products like in the innovation space, we've got some new gen AI product capabilities that we've launched to market as well. So that, that's the perspective of what we've done. There's huge opportunity for our industry to be more AI enabled across all aspects of the research life cycle. And that's brilliant and scary at the same time, I know, depending on where you sit in your own role in that research cycle, but also because we enjoy uh, like the teams enjoy doing some of the tasks as well, love questionnaire design, love anal analysis aspects of qualitative research. And actually, those are some of the areas where Gen AI can be most impactful and really take some of the hard yards away, but they're enjoyable hard yards for some of the team members. So I think across the business, it's been some mandatory training, but also demonstrating the use cases to the team about how this can enable them to do better, more impactful work for their clients. Gen AI can summarize beautifully with a few you know, research reviews along the, researcher reviews along the way. Can't really story tell brilliantly, and that's where we're focusing efforts in our other training areas to help people story tell even more effectively and to add value to the summary that Gen AI can do. So that value in the research chain, it's changing. And where our clients will perceive what they're willing to pay for by way of value will also be changing. And we need to be adapting to that ahead of the curve, which is a, a core part of what we're doing at Ipsos. Yeah. Well, you talked about the role of the researcher and what they do today. How do you see that changing mm -hmm. over time? Um, and and what, is, what is the researcher of the future in your mm -hmm. eyes? So it depends, and I, I guess that's a very wishy-washy response to your question, but it really depends wishy -washy on the- Wishy-washy question. Wishy, it was a wishy-washy <laughs> question, to be fair. Uh, I, I think it, it does depend on the nature of research that, that we do, and there, research is such a broad space now, like gathering data, whether it's passive, observational, qualitative, quantitative, it's such a broad space. And you, all of the research roles can be augmented and enhanced in some way by AI, but in different ways. And so it's every researcher's job to figure out what that is and to ensure that they are AI enabled for the future. But it, it's across every single aspect of the research sphere. Yeah. I think the creativity and the storytelling is something as an industry we're constantly working and improving, and that will become increasingly important because the value, as I say, is being disrupted in our research process. Yeah, sure. Josh, can I turn to you now? Um, so, Faculty is um, a company that builds sort of custom 
uh, AI-powered solutions to help companies make better decisions. Um, not familiar necessarily to everyone in the room, um, but can you, so can you just bring that to life for me and, and explain sort of how you're seeing your clients making use of AI um, and how they're sort of translating that kind of insight that they have into action? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So, um, as you said, faculty has been around for um, about 10 years, in fact, exactly 10 years next week, um, building AI systems. Um, so we're a consultancy, we're not a market research specialist, but I oversee our consumer work and therefore lots of the work that we do both with, with brands and with, with agencies um, in how to use AI. And so we've seen a lot of you know, what works uh, when it comes to AI systems. And I'm gonna, I think it's not great actually, so I like to have a bit of like, dissent with, <laughs> amongst the panel, yeah. but I'm gonna kind of violently agree um, with, no. with, with lots of what Jatin and, and, and Kelly have said already. Um, in terms of some of the things that we think are really important for how to think about this and what, um, and what typically works. And the first is, is that it, it really is important to frame this around use cases and decisions. Um, it is tempting when you see you know, a technology like ChatGPT um, to think, well, this is, this is amazing, it can, it can do anything and everything, and I can just pour data into it and kind of out, out will come kind of useful insights or useful, um, uh, useful actions. And, and I think time and time again, we've just seen that it, it doesn't really work like that. It's much, much better and much more productive to start with a clear sense of the types of decisions, the types of actions um, that you're looking to inform or take and, and work backwards from those. And what we've seen is actually the, the potential of generative AI in particular is to help kind of you know, shorten and tighten the, the, the decision loops or the feedback loops that exist in going from data through to a decision, through to an action, and then you know, back around the data again so you can kind of build that kind of virtuous cycle. So kind of one example of that, working with a kind of large um, beer company, and they started with kind of a, a, a hypothesis that, you know, could we just put all of our data into this and, and out will come some useful insights. And so we coached them quite strongly towards a kind of more painful part of the process, which is around kind of innovation briefs. And I know that's an area that will be familiar to many people in the room. But actually what we found is that, you know, as we've ex expanded from that initial decision, we've been able to help break down what is um, actually quite a lossy, you think of that process of going from a, you know, data to brief to action, it's quite a lossy process. Lots of data often gets thrown away to the point where now we're helping to use kind of that same generative system is going right into the hands of brewmasters, people who are kind of coming up with new formulations so that rather than receiving kind of a slide deck or a report, they receive something that's interactive and they can now interact with a tool that is allowing them to kind of develop and, uh, and invent new formulations. And that is really, I mean, that's kind of transformational in the way that they work, but it's also really importantly powered by great work behind the scenes from the insights teams who are crafting the data that's gone in and the way that that experience is managed and, and mitigated and, and, um, and operated by the, by the people that are using it. So I think that's important because it is not, it is not automatic, it is not magic, um, and it points to a quite a different role, I think, in terms of the, you know, what, what researchers are doing to prepare that for usage and, and output. Yeah, fantastic. Okay, Chris. You run um, the Global Insight function at, at Reckitt. Um, Josh just talked about sort of unlocking the power of insight. You're overseeing these huge uh, stores of insight gathered from all over the world. How are you using generative AI today, and where do you see the opportunities of drawing on that insight to kind of better manage it in, in, in the business? Yeah, so, so, so my role is uh, looking after the Insight Centre of Excellence in Reckitt. So a lot of that is making sure that our capabilities are as best as they can be. So I'm not taking Elaine's job just yet. She heads up the entire function. Um, oh. <laughs> so the record in me, uh, to echo Josh's one before I jump into that, uh, really wants to disagree or challenge. Uh, but unfortunately, it, uh, there isn't much. I think we, we've had a couple of sessions right when we've spoken ahead of this, and we, we agreed on a lot of things. But I think from a client point of view, there is some differences. So uh, how we're seeing the benefit at the minute is, if I break it down by... Um, looking internally and then looking as working with research agency partners, mm -hmm. that's probably the easiest way of doing it. Uh, first and foremost, internally, I think like a lot of companies, we're looking at pilots to look at uh, Gen AI technology. It's very important for us to be ahead of the game or on the curve from a point of view. So um, there's not too much detail I can go into, obviously, because it's, it's relatively confidential, but there is two key focus areas where we're looking at. The first, I think everyone can probably agree, is the lowest hanging fruit which is, and this is where maybe I do disagree with uh, Kelly, is that in Reckitt, 
there's a lot of boring jobs that people don't want to do. Mm -hmm. um, and a lot of that is um, frequent, repetitive, but consistent data sets. Um, performance reporting, media buying, uh, and so one of our areas, but it helps us drive the business in terms of making very key business decisions. So one of the big pushes within the pilots is looking at how we can drive productivity in that area. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and that's something that uh, we see as uh, a critical unlock to, for people's time to then spend on other um, uh, workflows in the, in the organization. Mm -hmm. The second is perhaps more interesting to me, and that's consumer centricity. Um, so looking at how we can unlock Gen AI uh, to help us get uh, a very data-rich led insight, um, but allow us to deep dive on the areas that really matter. So be that within innovation is, a, is one example, but other areas of the business as well. Um, I think that's critical. And then outside of that is how we communicate our brands to consumers. That's increasingly important as we look across an omni-channel view and making sure our content strategy is right and, and, and we're looking at how Gen AI can help with that to make sure we're delivering the, uh, the best possible content to our consumers in the best possible way at the best possible time. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's internal into, into Reckitt. Outside of that, and working with research agencies, um, I think how you started uh, uh, is probably where I'm landing at the minute in that there's a lot of exciting potential. Mm -hmm. um, I, I wouldn't say it's necessarily a reality right now. Um, I, I often see a lot of interesting ideas, specifically around innovation, but not limited just to innovation that agency or partners could offer us. Um, but to Justin's point, AI has been around, or traditional AI, and I think this is probably where people start to blur the lines of AI and Gen AI because they're very different beasts, right? And AI has been integrated and embedded into things for a fair amount of time. And really, that's where we're seeing the benefits still today with our research agency partners. So whether it be in innovation, pack design, in idea creation, insight generation, ele elements like that, we're already using a fair amount of AI um, I think the future um, is not yet here, uh, mm -hmm. and, I've, and, and that's the one thing that I remain cautious about. There's a lot of potential there, but it's, it's not fully attainable right now. Yeah, yeah, okay, thank you. Um, we've got, we're getting loads of questions coming in, so thank you for that. I think we might, we might jump to them in a minute, but can I, can I just take a step back just for a minute? And Kelly, can I come back to you? Um, people are at the heart of, yes. our, of our industry, understanding people. And is there a danger that perhaps using AI, perhaps using AI in, in the research gathering process, or, or, or just as, as it accelerates all of our worlds forward, that, that there's, a, there's perhaps a, a danger of leaving some people behind? I mean, how do people feel about generative AI? It's a, it's a really good point, and actually it links to the... The bit that you think we disagree on, I don't think we disagree <laughs> on at all. There are lots of boring things that AI can pick up, Gen AI can pick up and do, but also areas where you can people enjoy it and they don't want to give it up. But there, it also just, if you think about how the British public are utilising it at the minute mm -hmm. compared to professionals. So we know from our work that eight in ten business influencers or senior professionals are dabbling and playing about with generative AI. But we also know from our ability to passively measure what the British public are doing, only 7% of the British public are doing the same. There's quite a disconnect between people in professional roles uh, and their levels of seniority and the mass public. So it's worth reflecting on that. And then secondly, how the British public feel about AI more broadly. And we used to be a really tech positive, tech optimistic nation. But you can see in the work that we've done across 31 different countries, in Britain now we're more anxious than we are excited about generative AI and its possibilities. And for younger people, they're even more anxious than they are excited. Mm. And so there are real disconnects about how people are feeling about generative AI and their uptake and adoption. And general public, like when you look at your workforce, it's likely that your younger, your younger colleagues might be playing about with it more, etc., but they may also be increasingly anxious and worried about what it means for their own jobs and the tasks that they're doing, which may be some of the tasks that generative AI can, can help with faster than some of the tasks that more senior levels of staff or more specialist roles are undertaking. So I think there's a real job for us to take workforce and also the general public yeah. with us on this transformation and that's not straightforward. No, definitely. And, and it's moving so quickly that there's a danger that people feel left behind, whether yes. they're employees or, or, or people. And 
Um, that, that, that sort of chimes with one of the questions coming in around, you know, is there, is there a risk that we, we're moving too quickly? Chris, I don't know, in your, in your department, I mean, are you, are you seeing people feeling like there's a, there's a risk of being left behind? Or if we move certain functions, the boring functions, the things that you don't think researchers enjoy, we, 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 we give those to the machines, then we, perhaps we lose a core skill set Mm -hmm. um, in, in the whole kind mm. of uh, insight generation process? So I, I think, so yeah, I, I think generally speaking, from a Gen AI point of view, if we were to do a straw poll within Reckitt, the, uh, the, the mindset would probably be best described as glass half empty. <laughs> or, it, the, or maybe slightly better worded as cautiously op optimistic. <laughs> Um, I see it slightly differently because I'm a little bit closer to it than the rest of the, the, the organization. But what we are doing at the moment is understanding, um, building a base map of where jobs lie in terms of the, function, the roles that we play, uh, how much time we spend on things, critically what we enjoy doing and what we don't enjoy doing because we're, we're, we're wanting to acknowledge to make sure that we're not taking away jobs that people love to do. Similar to Kelly's point earlier, it just may be slightly different jobs that they enjoy doing if you're a marketeer. Um, but but I, think, I, I think it's important to, to make sure that um, we harness the potential and go at the right speed. Um, I think the lowest hanging fruit of driving productivity through your, your big data sets, as I mentioned before, is, is, is there for the taking, and we're already seeing some fairly promising results internally. But I, I don't know if we're yet ready for those more sophisticated tasks. Um, mm -hmm. uh, as an aside, uh, my, uh, I have two boys, and uh, we sometimes write bedtime stories with Chuck, GPT, mm -hmm. uh, and they've got to five prompts. They need to do it five times before they're happy with the story. So to, to Kelly's point earlier, storytelling is definitely mm -hmm. something it's not quite ready for yet, right. as far as I'm concerned. Um, but if we think about those more sophisticated tasks and helping us drive innovation, um, uh, where we're asking the data to do a lot more than just pull, pull some uh, reports out of, of data sets, then that's a trickier, trickier beast to handle. Um, one of the things that I'm becoming more and more cognizant of is Gen AI can help you be uh, a winner in the moment, but can, you, can it help you be a winner sustainably? Mm. And, that, and that, I think, is a big point, because if you want to maintain your edge, then that's something we need to consider, and therefore having the right frameworks in mind, ingesting data sets on a continual basis, harnessing the power of social, which I think is huge, mm -hmm. that we think about how we humanize our data and keep it fresh and disruptive, mm -hmm. but, and there's people uh, better versed to talk about how it's ingested into the LMM, LLMs, but in its current form, it can overtake something that may be a foundational piece of understanding that actually should be weighted a little bit more importantly. So there's work to be done on how we yeah. build it into our models, but those types of things, I think we need a very clear framework before we run, before we can walk. Yeah, yeah. can we yeah. build on that point and, and maybe put this one to you, Jatin? There's a question coming in um, about how confident we can be in, in the model. So um, how sure are we that, they don't, that the AI models don't perpetuate explicit or unconscious bias in the insights that they generate, especially given that a lot of the historical training data has got a lot of bias because it was written by biased humans. I think that's a fantastic question. And to be honest, I think you just have to look at the pace at which things are changing. So I agree with you that um, we do need to be mindful around how these LLMs develop and what data sources use, are used behind that. So transparency is key in all of that. So every tech organization who builds an LLM should be publishing how they're LLMs were developed and mm -hmm. what data sources they were trained on. I think we are getting there, we're not there yet, um, but I, I certainly see that as a big thing. And I think the good thing this time around with this technological advancement is that there's greater awareness of that as compared to other technological advancements we've, we've seen and the biases carried through. So I think that, that's the first thing. The second thing is every industry that will end up using some sort of AI will need to be more conscious and more aware of that. Mm -hmm. in terms of, are you using synthetic data, for example? And I think you know, research industries is a classic example where there is that risk of using synthetic data. And the ethics around that and what outcomes that will generate over a period of time is a risk that every industry and every organization will need to manage. Mm -hmm. But I think there, is, there are lots of safety, um, um, there's a lot of safety being thought through around how we make sure that that doesn't happen. Mm -hmm. But it's never going to be 
truth. I mean, it, it will fail. There will be situations where it will end up doing things. And I can give you a classic example. Mm -hmm. All the uh, video uh, cameras that we use on in Zoom or um, Teams or anything like that have a brown person sit in front of it. And you'll see how it changes the contrast because they were not trained on different skin colors. Yeah, yeah. But there is awareness now, and I think we can see in new data sets where there is consideration for different variety of data to, to be brought in. Mm -hmm. But there's that risk that I think you know, many industries and organizations will have to manage. Yeah, I mean, we could talk a lot about responsible AI, and, exactly. and um, that's a very big issue. I'm, le I, I'm, I'm conscious that we're doing this in a slightly weird way where people are writing um, questions on the Slido, but it would be nice to have a bit of human interaction rather than these, which are probably generated by ChatGPT, <laughs> for all I know. So, is there anyone in the room that actually wants to speak to us? Yes, hand up over there. There's a mic coming your way. Thank you. Uh, do you think that there's mainly a push for efficiency rather than unlocking new ways of doing things with AI? And is, do you think that's accelerated by economic crisis, like lower margins? and using AI for efficiency instead of pushing for unlocking new ways of unlocking insights or new methodologies or kind of generating new things? Mm. And is it just about automation and efficiency? Josh, do you wanna, you're all about efficiency. Aren't yeah, you? I'm all about efficiency. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, I better be a quick answer. I'll, I'll read the subject. Um, I think at the moment, it's a great question. At the moment, there is a huge focus on how to do things that you currently do more efficiently, faster, in a less manual way. Um, honestly, I think a large part of that is driven by the fact that these models are, you know, they're data hungry when you use them, and it's easier to take an existing process, which has lots of data around it, and do it faster or better. It's easier to point at the business case, right, the value of doing that more efficiently, than it is to do something genuinely new or novel, where there might not yet be data to support that process, or you have to create a new process, or to some of the other discussion, skills or training around running that process to actually bring it to life. I don't think that means that the, the, the new stuff is off the table at all. I actually just think it's the process by which technology like this generally gets adopted. First, you use it to do the current things you do in a slightly better way. Then, as people get more familiar with and comfortable with both how to use the technology and the risks, people start to get more comfortable to do genuinely novel things. I just think it's an, it's an, my view is it's an adoption thing rather than a, a limiting factor of the technology. Mm -hmm. Kelly, do you want to build on it's that? It's a fabulous question, really, really good question. And I think if you look at how organizations are rolling out and tackling generative AI, it'll give you the answer for that particular organization. Those that sit it purely in operations, it's an efficiency drive. Those that sit it with clients and you know, product design, it is more about what you can do to generate better insights. And we have one human in each leading the way. One, because we're interested in both. Of course we're interested in both. Even during an economic crisis, as we've seen over the last couple of years, where things have been definitely tighter for our industry, even in those moments, you want to be able to drive better insight. Of course you do, because it, it creates more uh, client demand. Yeah. Um, yes, question at the front here. Do you want to wait for the microphone to come to you, or shout very loudly? Just hold shout on. Shout quite loudly. <laughs> here it comes. training of the AIs, uh, and I agree with Chris that you should publish how you uh, train the AIs and the data sources. One of the key questions that I'm thinking about is the, Amer the uh, writer's uh, training issue mm. of getting permission to train it with other people's data sources. How do you govern that? <laughs> I can, I can share my views. I think it's a really challenging thing. I mean, if you, think, if you look at what most of the AI companies are talking about, they're basically saying they need access to copyrighted data in order for their models to do a better job. Now, that in itself is a challenge. And I think the industry and the way we do things will have to change. And we see this already in the way we contract with artists. There are now specific clauses that call out how their voice is going to be used, how their face is going to be used, and not just used in the content that we're creating, but in any medium that the content is used. So there will be more granularity around how access to content is given, particularly around the type of data that is used, I think will matter quite a lot. Um, 
Governance is going to be quite challenging. I'm not going to say that it's a straightforward answer just yet, because anything that's available on the internet is technically available for these AIs to go and consume them and train them. Um, the, the, if a classic example is that you know storytelling. It's able to write a story. It might not be perfect, but it will give you 70, 80% of the story that you can build upon. My personal view is I think there needs to be explicit exchange of value with any kind of contracting. So for example, if an artist contracts to create a new piece of content, there should be explicit. The way, same way music industry has dealt with this uh, for many years, where you know, any track that an artist produces is consumed, they, you give royalty back. It's a similar kind of thing. How that's going to happen, I don't know yet. But it is definitely a challenging situation. Mm -hmm. Getting a lot of questions about the race to the bottom. Is there a risk that um, uh, Gen AI uh, kind of disintermediates people, makes the research process cheaper, um, and it becomes so attractive to clients that they want to kind of use perhaps synthetic respondents rather than re talking to real people? Chris, is that an issue that you've thought about? Uh, yes. Um, so I, I think back to it, it kind of ladders from the question we had before as well on, on, on efficiency. I think it's, that's a, an obvious advantage that people want to go after. Um, I think if we think about um, uh, other elements of it though, it's, it's synthetic testing I'm, I'm personally not on board with. I think it, it can very quickly generate an echo chamber um, and get to me mediocre very, very quickly. So I think there's two elements that, from my point of view, that we, we look at and I think we need to be conscious of as we, as we move into the stage, because I don't think we're there yet. One is the quality of the research and the data sets that we put into the tool. Mm -hmm. Maybe more simplistically, it's like a conjoint. You put rubbish in, you're going to get rubbish out. And that we should be very much aware of. And I think efficiency plays a hand in that in allowing us to spend that extra time on really truly understanding what should be going into it. So I think the quality of data is very, very important there uh, to, to enable that. That said, you're, st you're still within a, a closed loop system. So, and, and I'll, so I'll come back to my point on, on social. I think it's incredibly important. Revealed data is, is important in many aspects, but I think obviously the privacy, privacy issues aside, if we find a way of harnessing that, that allows us to be very, very disruptive yeah. um, and, and make sure that we're actually selling something that is, uh, gives us an edge rather than just it's what everyone else is saying. Sure. Mm. Kelly, do you want to come in on that? Yeah, if I may, just I think what it will do is, and what it is doing, is increasing the value placed on the quality of your human capital, the people that you've got, the levels of intelligence that you have within your organisations, their expertise, and it, it will. So we've been doing a lot of workforce planning, workforce strategy design at Ipsos, not just because of generative AI, but it's just good to have a five-year workforce strategy, quite frankly. And in that, what you can really see is the mix changing between what you buy, what you build, and what you borrow, those three things. And historically, the industry is buy and build. You, you buy in core talent, you train and develop that talent in the way that you want them to be you know, developing their research skills. And that, that is something slightly unique to your organization, some stuff's good practice. But the borrow aspect, where you're borrowing true deep expertise that can add value to your clients in a really specialist niche area, we could see an acceleration in interest in that particular component of the staffing and the workforce strategies for major research companies. And that, that is an interesting dynamic. Yes, buy, yes, build. But actually, the specialist borrowing to get the top, how do you create contracts with individuals who have true deep expertise so that they keep working with you? And that's something that we're thinking about. Fantastic. OK, there's so many more questions here. We're out of time. There's a big red light flashing at the back. Um, I'm sorry if we didn't get to your questions. Um, I hope that those of you who were a bit mystified at the beginning are a bit less mystified, a bit clearer about where the opportunities lie in this space for us all. And will you join me in thanking my fantastic panel, Kelly, Josh, Chris and Jack. <laughs>